Okay, great. So I'll try, I'll try to use this pointer, but okay, moves in a weird way, but okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and everybody who has made this uh, workshop possible. So I'm going to tell you about some work that we are doing on data-driven subgrid scale modeling. Uh, we focus on issues related to stability, extrapolation, for example, to a, a larger forcing or Reynolds number using transfer learning to actually enable such extrapolations and actually trying to interpret to see what's learned during transfer learning. Uh, this is work that uh, different parts of it is jointly done by Yifei, Adam, who was an undergraduate in our group, now is a PhD student at Grant, and uh, Ashish. So Laura has already uh, basically laid out the problem of why we need uh, subgrade scale modeling, why we need a closure. We basically do not have the enough computing power to resolve all the relevant scales. So I'm going to basically go quickly through these uh, introductory slides. Uh, Laura already very nicely uh, discussed this. So um, I'm going to, in the next few slides, use X to represent a large and a slow scale variables, things that we're actually we are interested in, and Y to represent the small and fast scale variables that we cannot ignore, and these act, but these will be end up being the subgrid scale uh, variables. So we know that for a long time, we have been developing physics-based closures so that we can basically write the governing equations in uh, closed form in terms of the, the larger scale, and then we can numerically solve these equations at a low resolution grids. Uh, but we know that we need better closure models, better parameterizations. And so in the past few years, there has been a lot of interest in what machine learning can be do. And there are different ways that machine learning can be used. For example, machine learning methods can be used to uh, better estimate the, some of the parameters in the existing uh, subgrid scale models, but also a different approach, like the one that Laura uh, is pursuing, and that's what we are uh, pursuing, is to actually leave it to the machine learning method, like a neural network, to learn the relationship between X and Y in high resolution, high fidelity data, and then we use that in the low resolution numerical model. So the focus of my talk, talk would be this kind of non-parametric data-driven parameterization. Now, like most applications of machine learning, even once you know what exactly you want to do with machine learning, there are a lot of questions and challenges to answer. So here we want to do this data-driven parameterization. Then we have to think about what's the best machine learning methods to use. Uh, how to deal with the poor data regime. In most cases, we actually do not have a lot of high quality data for training. How to incorporate physics or some of the properties of the equations, maybe to better deal with the poor data regime. After that, how to actually interpret and try to understand what the machine learning method is doing. And I deal with issues related to generalization, specifically extrapolation to higher forcing, higher Reynolds number, things that are essential for these kind of approaches to be useful. And then at the end, issues related to instability that many studies uh, have found that you can develop a data-driven closure model that seems accurate in the offline test. You couple it with the low resolution numerical solver and it blows up. So in our group, we have been thinking about uh, most of these questions in the past few years. And today I'll tell you a little bit about some work we are doing on instability um, and actually how uh, incorporating physics can address that in the low uh, in the poor data regime. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we are doing with transfer learning to enable extrapolation and actually interpreting what's going on in transfer learning. So the test case we are starting with is a very idealized, basically test case, two-dimensional turbulence, which is a very simple model for turbulence in atmosphere and ocean, but we think it can be a good starting point to look at some of the questions that we want to answer. So here, basically, these are the equations. Omega is vorticity, the Reynolds number, F is the forcing. Um, I start with the case when there is no forcing, so we are looking at decaying turbulence. Uh, we can solve these equations uh, basically numerically without any further approximation and a high resolution grid and do basically what's called a direct numerical simulation or DNS. And in this talk, I'm going to treat DNS as the truth. Now, we can try to do LES. So we are going to filter these equations as uh, Laura and Rose already talked about this. So we know that we cannot close the equations in terms of omega bar and psi bar. And we will end up with this extra term. I'm going to call this pi. That's the, basically the subgrid scale term. This is actually, in, in this case, it's the curl of that S term that Laura had. 
And so basically the overbar would involve some coarse graining and filtering. Now, the advantage of the LES is pretty clear. We can, we, we can solve these equations on a much uh, coarser grid. For example, we can decrease the resolution by a factor of eight in each direction. We can take larger time steps. So it's like 640 times fewer degrees of freedom in doing this simulation. But we will need to have a model for pi. For example, uh, going back to the 60s, one of the first models is the Smogronsky model, which basically says that because we know that the eddies to a good degree are doing diffusion, we can basically represent that as a basically some sort of eddy viscosity that, uh, that would be our pi. Now, what we are trying to do here is to actually leave it to a neural network, in our case, a CNN, to actually learn this pi term from the DNS data in terms of the filtered vorticity and a stream function, and then we use that in this equation. And the results that I'm going to show in the next few slides are from this paper that is uh, available on archive. So just to give an idea of what are the, some of the shortcomings of these uh, physics-based models, some of the physics-based models, like the Smogronsky model, is that they only account for diffusion. They do not account for what's called backscattering. To see that, we can define a function, the subgrid scale transfer T, which I'm going to define it like this, pi times the Laplacian of vorticity. Note that for a Smogronsky type model, when we have pi as a viscosity times the Laplacian, this term is always positive. But now we can diagnose from the DNS data whether T is always positive or not. So here I'm showing you a snapshot of the filtered vorticity field. The second row, this is just zooming in into this box. This is the transfer function from the filtered DNS. This is, we can treat it as the truth. We'll see that it's red in many places, but also in some places, this is blue. So it says that we not, we, what the eddies do, basically it's not always to transfer energy and entropy from the resolved scale to the unresolved scale, but also you can have backscattering or really in this case, it's sort of anti-diffusion. You can have transfer from unresolved to the resolved the scales. If you do long time averaging and domain averaging, this is, T is going to be positive, but at different times and, and, and uh, grid points, you can have backscattering. Now, the eddy viscosity models and many physics-based models, they only account for diffusion. And actually, usually they have too much diffusion to stabilize the numerical solvers. But as you see, it's basically red everywhere. So we want to train a CNN basically a non-local, non-parametric data-driven parameterization model to see whether we can do any better. The input to our uh, CNN that has 10 layers are basically the filtered field and the output is pi. I'm not going to go through the details of the CNN. Um, we have a simple uh, MSC loss function. I want to emphasize for now, there is no physics in the, neural, in the neural network architecture and there is no physics in the loss function. Also, this is deterministic, memoryless. It doesn't have UQ. And we assume that DNS data is not noisy. We have the clean data. These are kind of simplifications that we can relax and, and uh, like for example, what the Laura is doing in adding a stochasticity. But for now, we are basically using this simple model. Okay. And we have basically independent DNS sets that we use for training, validation, and testing. So here is the transfer function from the CNN that we have trained. Again, this is the truth uh, from the filter DNS, uh, the last column. Okay. Okay, the last column, this is from the dynamic Smogronsky model. And here, this is from the CNN, which actually does a pretty good job. Even when you zoom in, you see that it captures both diffusion and vacuum scattering pretty well. Uh, the third column here, this is from a, just a feed forward neural network, which is local. So basically uses one grid point and the adjacent grid points to that. And from this paper that was published in JFM a few years ago, but actually we see that this ANN also does a good job. Now we can calculate the correlation coefficient between the predicted pi and the pi from the DNS over many samples. And we can look at this correlation coefficient. So we'll see that the Smogronsky models have very low correlation. This has been known for a long time. The ANN is over 85%, and the CNN is actually around 93% correlation. So pretty good performance for both CNN and ANN in the offline mode. I should say that this is not an apple to apple comparison. With more work, you can also bring up the ANN 
uh, correlation coefficient above uh, 0.9. But we know that this is not the end of the story. We know that you can have these kind of high correlations in the offline test, but then when you couple these models, they blow up. And that's actually what was reported in that JFM paper. They found oh, this doesn't move forward. So they actually found that this ANN would actually lead to instabilities. What they did is what's called positive clipping, which is actually has been also used for the physics-based model, which is wherever your model is, your SGS model is predicting backscattering, you actually set that to zero. And that would lead to a more diffusive model, but then you get a stable solver. But then in this case, you pretty much lose the, the advantages of using uh, machine learning. Again, I should say that these issues with stabilities have happened before, even for physics-based models, like dynamic Smogronsky also does something like this to avoid backscattering. But we know that we like to capture backscattering in some problems. So in our case, we also saw that this can happen to RCNN, but then it depends on the size of the training set. So here, N, this is the number of training samples from 500 to 50,000, C is that correlation. And the last row basically tells you the fate of an online simulation if we couple that CNN to the model. We'll see that when we have 500 samples, the correlation is 0.78, we get an unstable simulation. We keep increasing it to 10,000, still unstable. When we go to 30,000, the correlation coefficient increases a little bit, but then we get to a stable simulations. Now to see what this happened, we actually calculated C separately for grid points that do diffusion versus backscattering. And then we saw something that I think is interesting, which is the diffusion was captured well, even with 500 samples. So increasing the number of samples by a factor of 100, we actually got a little increase of 0.1 in the correlation coefficient. On the other hand, for backscattering, doing the same thing, there was an increase of 0.3 in the correlation, which basically suggests that backscattering is harder to learn data drivenly when the training set is small. And we, we think that this disproportional low accuracy for backscattering is the reason for instabilities. Yes. That's what we thought first. We looked at the number of grid points is 60% to 40%. So 60%, they have diffusion, 40% back is heavy, but also the, the, the magnitude that things like that we didn't look at. Um, and again, this makes sense because again, back is catching means that the smaller scales are forcing the larger scales. So if they're not done right, if they're at the wrong place, with the wrong amplitude, they can just destabilize the simulation. Okay. So after that, once we get a stable CNN, I'm not going to spend much time on this. You kind of qualitatively see that the CNN does much better than models like Smogronsky, which are too diffusive. You see advantages in short-term forecasting and also in the, in the long-term statistics. For example, you look at the spectrum. Perhaps the best place that you can see the advantage of CNN over these other methods is if you look at the PDF of vorticity. So here we'll see that the tails of the PDF, the CNN matches pretty well. With the, with the truth, with the DNF. On the other hand, the Smogronsky type models or the ANN or even the CNN without backscattering, they all would be too diffusive. So beyond around two standard deviation, they actually deviate from the PDF. So here's the conclusion so far. So with regard to instability, we think instabilities could, could happen due to inaccuracies that result from a small training set. Of course, we're not saying that this is the case with any instability that uh, people find in this kind of work, but this is a very simple diagnostic that can be done to get a sense of whether this difference between uh, backscattering or diffusion is the problem. Now, of course, you might say that, well, we don't have large data sets for many problems, so this can be an issue. Now, what we have done since then is to look at how adding physics to the CNN uh, might actually help with getting accurate to stable simulations, even in the small data regime. Now, I'm just going to talk about this very briefly on this one slide, but one thing I want to mention is that whether you have a small data regime or a large data regime is not just the number of samples, but it actually depends on how much that your data samples are correlated. But 
In this work, we saw that we actually tried three things to deal with the small data regime. One is by data augmentation, basically building symmetries into the inputs uh, by using equivariant CNNs, the type that uh, Rose talked about, basically building some physics into the architecture. And the, other, the last one is by actually uh, building some more physics into the loss function. For example, if you look at the global entropy budget in this model, there are constraints that we can find important. We can add them to the loss function. And we saw that using any of these, and certainly using some of them together, we can actually get a stable accurate result, basically the same performance with 50 samples rather than versus 2,000 samples. And these are results in a paper that is going to be submitted soon. If you're interested, we can chat more. But I'm going to move on to the part that I think is the most exciting uh, to us. And this is something we have been doing in the, in the past. Uh, year or so, and basically this is work that is led by Adam, and that's about using transfer learning to enable extrapolation and then interpreting what's going on with the transfer learning. So one question you might ask is, well, does this data-driven model extrapolate to a higher Reynolds number? And the answer is no, it doesn't. So here I'm showing you results from the online simulations when we have trained and tested the CNN on the Reynolds number of 8,000. So here, the black line, this is the spectrum of the FDNS, the kinetic energy. And the blue line, that's the CNN. So it works well when you do the testing and training on the same Reynolds number. Now, if you use that same CNN, trained on the Reynolds number of 8,000, and apply it to a flow that has a Reynolds number of 32,000 or 64,000, you get this red line. So the spectrum deviates, it doesn't extrapolate. Now, to address this, what we have done is transfer learning. So the idea of transfer learning is this. So, so far, what we have done, we have a flow with a given Reynolds number, has a distribution. We have sample data from that distribution. We have trained all the 10 layers of the neural network, randomly initialized, and we did the training and we found the weights. Now, we are looking at the flow with, with higher Reynolds numbers. So the PDF, the distribution of the data, would be different. Of course, again, if you have n samples from this new system, you can go and repeat this and it would work. But let's say we don't have n samples again. Let's say we only have 1% of that. Now the idea of transfer learning is take that 1% of the data and retrain not all layers, but some of the layers. And also do not initialize them randomly, but initialize them with the weights that you already have. And you do this and you find new weights. This is an idea that, again, it has, of course, has been around the machine learning community for a, for, for a long time. Uh, and we have found that for like Lorentz system, for example, it works pretty well. You apply it to recurrent neural networks, to, to parameterization. Again, in Lorentz system, it works pretty well. We have also applied it to the Berger's turbulence, one-dimensional turbulence, and it works pretty well. So here we want to apply this to 2D turbulence, to the problem we have been talking about. And so what we have done is that we retrained only the last two layers, the deepest two layers with 1% of the data. Now, the reason that we pick the deepest two layers, this is basically following the, the general understanding from the machine learning literature is that the shallower layers, they are learning the general features of a data. The specific features are learned in the deeper layers. So if you want to do transfer learning, you better retrain your deepest layers. So we did this. And it actually works pretty well. So you see that the same problem, now the, the dashed uh, red line, that's with the transfer learned CNN. And it basically works as well as if you were training a new CNN with N samples rather than a percent of some uh, N of uh, the new data. So, and again, these are results that are still in this paper. So now in the time that I've left, let me tell you about some newer work that we are doing, which we try to push uh, this, transfer learning into more and more complicated problems, but also try to see what is learned during this transfer learning. So we have extended this equation to add basically a linear damping term and a forcing term that you can basically force the system in different wave numbers in X and Y. And we have built three cases. In the first case, we are trying to do transfer learning from decaying turbulence to forced turbulence. Now, if you look at the flow, see that the flow is pretty different. The target flow has much larger scales compared to the base flow. We also see that in the, in the spectra of vorticity. If you look at the pi terms, 
we also see that they are different in terms of scales. They have different spectrums. They have large differences in the larger scales and also some differences in smaller scales. So we want to do transfer learning. We want to train here and then apply it here. The second case we are looking at is basically to extrapolate from a Reynolds number of 1,000 to Reynolds number of 100,000. And again, if you look at the flow field, if you look at the pi term, we'll see that they have different spectra. Again, the pi term, there are major differences in the larger scale and also some differences in the high wave numbers. The third case we are looking at is when we change the wave number of the forcing. So from wave number 25 to four, again, differences in the scales of the mean flow and also in the pi term, which again, here the differences are in the largest scale for the pi terms. So we basically train a base CNN using the base system and with N samples. And then with tens of that, we, train, we retrain uh, C the BNN and we call it the TLNN. Now, there's a lot here and these are online results. The point is, like what I showed you before, if you do not do transfer learning, the spectrum is going to be different. It's not going to work. You get these dashed blue lines rather than the, the solid red line, which is the true spectrum. On the other hand, if you do transfer learning for all these three cases, which are much more challenging than what we did before, this actually works well. Now, there's one more thing we did here, and that is we actually systematically looked at what happens if we train one layer, pairs of layers, or combination of three layers. And what we found was actually interesting that consistently, actually the best layer to retrain is the shallowest layer, layer two, right after the input. So for these two cases, it was actually as good as anything else that we could have got from the combination. In this case, also adding layer five was bringing a little bit, but really it's about actually the shallowest layer, which is the opposite of what uh, the general uh, basically understanding from the machine, uh, machine learning literature might suggest. So we thought that there are some questions that we can look at here. One is, what is learned during transfer learning? We thought that because we are only changing one layer, actually there might be hope that we can understand what's going on. The other one is, given a base CNN and data from a new system, can we actually know a priori what is the best layer or layers to retrain? And so the optimal goal of this work is still ongoing is to develop a framework that can guide transfer learning. And also beyond that, to actually being able to build more accurate transfer learning networks with fewer data. If we understand what needs to be done, maybe we can bake some of that into the training process and actually get better results with fewer samples. And in the next few minutes, I'll show you the results that we have. And we have made progress on these first three. Okay, so these are the results that basically I mentioned before. This is, for example, for one case, we are looking at the correlation of pi between what the CNN, the retrained CNN predicts and the DNS data. And this is the correlation as we retrain individual layers. And you'll see that actually, as we go to deeper layers, that correlation coefficient, the accuracy decreases. And again, this is something you will see in the online simulations. Again, this is the kinetic energy of the LES, uh, the black line, this is the, the truth. Uh, here, the dashed uh, black line, this is if you hope your base CNN to extrapolate, which it doesn't. Now, if you retrain layer 10, the results would be here. It's as bad as not doing any transfer learning. On the other hand, if you pick layer two, you will get this red line, which is much better. Again, if you add layer five, this would become even better. And the point is that when you don't have, when you have fewer data to retrain, actually picking the right layers would become even more important. So we try to look more into what's going on. And before telling you about what we have found, let's just make sure we are all on the same page about the terminology. So this is our neural network from the input to the output. There's a lot going on here. The only thing that matters is actually this equation. So this is the equation that governs the neural network. Here, G, this is the activation of channel A for layer L. So these are 128 by 128 matrices. That's the, basically the, our LES resolution. And these are actually what's shown here. These are examples of those activations. Now, here we have a convolution between weight matrix W on the activation from the previous layer. 
So this W, these are basically five by five matrices. These are the weights of the filter. And if you're wondering how they look like, this is an example of one of those filters. The five by five matrix, it's hard to look at it and get any meaning about what it is, but I will tell you what this one does. And remember that there are 64 squared filters on, in each layer. And then there's a bias term and everything is linear here. And then you have the ReLU activation function that is that brings in nonlinearity. Okay. So what we did next, we looked at the uh, activation in the last layer, layer 10, averaged over all the channels. Um, I don't have time to really go through all the details here. The point is what we found is that retraining layer 10 basically cannot change the spectrum compared to what a base CNN does. And even if it does, it cannot make, make cause any change in the larger scales. And again, remember that by pi terms, the major difference they have are in the larger scales. On the other hand, if you retrain layer two, that would be the red line here, it can basically make a difference compared to the black line, which is the base CNN in all lens scales. So again, a bit more evidence showing that retraining layer 10, and layer 10 is just a representative of the deepest layer. It basically cannot get that change that we need in the larger scales. So now you might ask, well, what controls the spectrum of these activations? And to remind you, this is the equation for the activation. I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So remember, this is the equation for the activation. It has a part in blue, that's the linear part. I'm just going to call that H from- Can I ask a question? Sure. It, why you would expect the layer, and this is completely my ignorance about no the machine learning side. I would have expected layer two to be the one that you had to. And why is that? I don't know, but intuitively. So why you were expecting layer 10? So, so this goes back to what's in the, again, like the work that has been done in machine learning, a lot of it based on classification problems, right? The idea is that the shallow layers learn the general features of a data, right? They find the edges and things like that. And the deeper layers, they are the ones that find something specific about this data set. So if you have trained something on cats and you want to use it on dots, the general features are the same. So the specific features are different. So you should go and retrain the deepest layers. So most of the transfer learning that is done for, for other applications, they're actually all about the deepest layers. But if your point is that as a turbulence person, there is universality in the smaller scales, right? And the changes are in the larger scales, go and retrain the larger scales. Sure, that's exactly what it is. But also it's not very clear that the shallowest layers are necessarily learning the larger scales, okay? Okay, so that's sort of what we want to see. We want to see that actually how we get the spectrum of this. Remember that during transfer learning, we update these weights and also we update the biases, but those are small. So we want to know when we change the weights, how the spectrum of G of the activations change. Now we can show that actually you can take the Fourier transform of this nonlinear function and you can actually analytically write the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform would be this, it has two parts. One part that depends on the, on the Fourier transform of H, which directly is related to the uh, Fourier transform of W. And then there is this part, there is a summation over grid points alpha. Alpha, those are all the grid points when H is positive. Remember that the ReLU function only operates on positive values. And that's why this part comes in. So what basically it says that there are two ways that when you update your weights, there are two ways that you can change the spectrum of the activation directly by changing the spectrum of H and indirectly by changing where H is positive. So now all of this says that instead of looking at these weights in the physical space, look at their spectra. And again, remember that our neural network doesn't know anything about the Fourier space. The inputs, outputs, everything was in the physical space. But basically once we use the convolution theory and we calculate the Fourier transform of these, this is the Fourier transform of these five by five matrix. And we'll see that this is basically a nice low pass filter. It's non-zero at the center around, around low wave numbers, and then it's zero everywhere else. So by looking at this spectra of the base, we can actually get 
a sense about their meaning. And so before talking more about transfer learning, you might ask, well, what are even these weights that are learned during uh, when you train a CNA? And again, there are 64 squared of them, but after looking at them for a while, we realized, you know, there are just several types. So we did came in clustering on the weights, and this is basically the eight cluster centers. And what you'll see is that we have a low pass filter, we have a bunch of band pass filters, and then we have a bunch of high pass filters. So that's basically what the CNN learns. And this is true for the other cases as well. So now to understand what's learned during transfer learning, we can actually look at the weights that have changed the most in their spectra during transfer learning. And here I'm showing you the change in the four that have changed the most. And four and five usually that they are very well separated from the changes in the rest. And here what you see is that in case two, layer two, basically from, from filters that we're not doing much, we have just learned a bunch of low pass filters. On the other hand, for layer 10, basically it's hard to know what these changes are. Again, for case three, something similar, we have just learned some low pass filters. And here we have learned filters that it's not quite clear what they are doing. Because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to basically not mention this. So, so far everything has been consistent. And basically the idea that shallow layers versus uh, deep layers and why difference, basically through those diagnostics of looking at the spectra and the activations, we can get a sense of why it happens. But you might ask, well, without doing any transfer learning, if I have a base CNN and some new data, can you tell me what is the best layer to retrain? And we think that that can be done by looking at the lost landscape of the CNN with new data. I'm not going to spend time on this, but I'll be happy to chat during the Q&A afterwards. But basically the idea here is that perturb your uh, weights in random directions and recalculate your loss function with the new data and the perturbed weights. And that would give you an idea of which layers for this data are actually better going to be trained. And here, this is the loss landscape of layer two. It's a convex function. Uh, here, this one is non-convex for layer 10. Again, for this data, it gives you an idea about that. Because I'm running out of time and the last talk before lunch. So I'm just going to put this as a slide here, just answering those questions for this specific application and the architecture. What is learned during transfer learning? New spectral filters, in this case, low pass filters. What are the optimal layers to retrain? Here, because the differences are in the larger scales, the shallowest layers. Now, how transferable and generalizable are these findings to other problems? We think that for the first question, for, uh, it's actually going to be the same. Again, if you think of other applications of transfer learning, it's either SGS modeling or full data-driven forecasting, maybe when a parameter changes, or maybe if you want to basically blend two data sets, maybe large training data set with a smaller high fidelity data set from observation. For all these applications, we think probably going to be something similar, but again, you can check. For question two, the answer we think would depend on the data and the architecture. And because of that, we have been working on developing a framework that would guide the transfer learning. Um, I'm not going to go through the details, but the framework starts by first looking at how the spectra of the data changes in the input and output, and also by calculating this loss plan escape, which is actually something pretty straightforward to do. So even before spending time and looking at all the layers and things like that, putting these two together, it can actually provide a lot of information on what you can do. Anyway, I'll put this here and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, and Annalisa Bracco. <laughs> um, did you try SQG? Being still 2D, so very similar, but it should probably give you higher higher layers. Uh, my best guess. So we haven't looked at that. We are, we are now moving to applying this to QG. Uh, QG is the same. Oh, yeah, but, but there are other things about the dynamics we can change. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked at SQG. We'd be happy to chat about uh, better test cases. We're also looking at really Bernard convection. So we are trying to apply this approach to several different cases so that we can get a better sense of how generalizable these findings are. So we'd be happy to chat about SQG. 
Uh, I'm Robert Pincus. There's, I have two questions. I'm sure they're both um, ignorant. One is, is, is there um, any theoretical reason why you retrain one layer at a time rather than some other set of coefficients within your neural network? So you could imagine tr training different parts of different layers, for example. Is there a theoretical reason why you don't do that? Or is that uh, practical? No, I mean, so, so we have been looking at training one layer or two layers or combination of three layers or even more. But of course, the more you want to train, you will need more data. But generally how it's done is just training a whole layer. We haven't tried to train only part of the layer because again, it's hard to know what part of the layer means. But again, and, and, and for in each layer, there are 64 squared filters, right? So what we hope that this tells us is that if we can identify the four and five, the four five that are the best to retrain, and the last landscape can actually be calculated for each of them uh, separately. We think that that actually might be way of, with even fewer data, you can get the same results. So yes, that's uh, like that last item. If we know what we need to change, then maybe we can only focus on that. Okay, and then a second question is, you know, it's one thing to retrain at Reynolds number 100 and, and then retrain at Reynolds number 100,000. Sure. What happens in the middle? Do you, have to, do you have to transfer learn each individual Reynolds number or is it possible to interpolate? Is it possible to extrapolate? So, so the models do a good job in interpolating. So the problem is extrapolation. So if you have, if you want to get some the results for a Reynolds number below that, that would be okay. The extrapolation is really the challenge. Also, that's something like people have found, for example, when they change SSD, if, if it's the SSD beyond the training manifold, it would be a problem. In between, it would work, it would be fine. Yeah, thanks, Pedro. I'm uh, Lorzana. Uh, great talk again, as always. Um, so I guess it might be related to what Annalisa asked earlier. So right now, in your field, I mean, it's mostly isotropic, right? Yes. So, I mean, some of the work we've done with Andrew, which I kind of barely mentioned at the end is, so we went from learning, in a, you know, in a simulation where we have no jets, where it's all even, you know, even if it's QG, so there's a bit of an asymmetry, but we don't get a strong large scale flow. And when we try to transfer to something that has, you know, very different dynamical structure, it's a lot harder. And so the equation discovery actually does better than regular CNN. Did you, did you try or do you have a feel how it's gonna perform? Uh, so, yeah, that, that's a great question. So for now, we have been looking at this one case, but again, we were thinking of going to QG when you have a jet, like the like an atmospheric setup, then you have a jet and you can change the, the deformation radius and the, and the like beta and things like that and see when you have that kind of change in the regime, what happens. So here, but sure, we are looking at then just the scales change. We have one case that actually you get forward cascade and, and inverse cascade, but Yes, in that sense, it is much simpler than and the, like the kind of problem that you are you are mentioning. So, so that would be the next step to also look at those kind of problems and then see how this picture changes. But again, like I think these are like diagnostic tools that can help a lot in terms of visualizing actually what these filters do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think it's it's fantastic. And Adam gave us a group meeting talk a yeah. few weeks ago. We were blown away. It was yeah, I was mostly curious if yeah, if we were applying that to those kind of more complicated cases, can we learn something about the scale interaction directly from the filters? Mm. And again, can we make that more generalizable as well? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that would be really um, interesting to look at cases like that. Do. Yeah. Okay, thank you.